All right, so we'll give everybody just a second just to roll in and get their audio working. But welcome. Thank you for joining us on this Tuesday evening. And tonight you are joining us for a webinar on the North American model. I'm gonna be your moderator. My name is Dawn Anderson and I am the Hunter Education and Archery Education Coordinator in the Western Region for the Department of Wildlife. And tonight your host, the main man is Martin Olson. He is the Hunter Education Coordinator down in the Southern Region and our North American model guru. So thank you everybody for joining us tonight. This is a family friendly program and it's rated PG. Profanity and inappropriate behavior will not be tolerated in the chat and Q&A. All questions in the chat and Q&A should remain on topic. Failing to do so will result in being muted from the chat and Q&A or possibly being removed from the live stream. This presentation contains strong images. Discretion for some viewers is advised. And with that, we are gonna move on to our agenda. This is what we are looking at this evening. We are looking at the North American model of wildlife conservation. We are gonna be looking at the seven principles, the lesson of the Kaibab. Kaibab, I wanna pronounce it completely different, Kaibab. <laughs> wildlife laws and acts 1871 and up, the wildlife restoration, Pittman Robertson funding, the Nevada Department of Wildlife timeline, as well as any endow projects. And with that, I'm going to pass the reins over to Marty. Welcome everybody and enjoy. <laughs> if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A. Thanks, Dawn. Uh, I appreciate that fabulous introduction. That was uh, very nice. Uh, I appreciate that. And we're going to start off by just looking at a, a, a North American model of conservation in wildlife timeline. So uh, the, mo the biggest question I uh, get usually is I'll ask somebody, are, do you know what the North American wildlife conservation model is? And usually I'll get the answer, yeah, it is the Pittman-Robinson Act uh, or the Wildlife Restoration Act. And, and that's true in, in some uh, essence. Uh, but there's so much more to the uh, North American model of wildlife conservation. And that's what we're going to get through here on this webinar. Uh, and we'll see throughout century uh, all of the changes that come to be and then where we were kind of at the beginning. So this is just kind of a rough timeline, which what we're going to kind of be covering some of these things. Uh, there's a lot of really neat stuff in here. Uh, how organizations came to, uh, to get started, uh, departments and government that got started, uh, whether it would be the BLM, uh, the Forest Service, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, all these things came into play during some time during this model. And so basically across North America, uh, hunting was largely unregulated. Uh, and it was it was deemed okay. Uh, people were uh, hunting for several different reasons. Uh, one, of course, was just living off the land and, and getting game and meat and material for clothing for yourself. And then there was commercial use as well, because not everybody uh, was out in the field hunting and gathering this kind of stuff. There was people who lived in the cities and, and they relied on this material coming in uh, from out in the country and everything. So there was a lot to it there. Uh, but uh, citizens began around the, the mid to late 1800s uh, to ask whether wildlife populations could continue uh, at healthy levels uh, if we continue to do this. Uh, the legal framework that since developed grew a set of principles and these principles now are known as the North American model of conservation. The seven features uh, make up the North American model. And uh, off to the side there, uh, you can see seven features. I've heard them called the seven principles. 
And if you get a lot of early paperwork, uh, I've heard them uh, originally called the seven sisters uh, is what they were. And, and basically these seven principles uh, is what uh, we look at today. And number one is that wildlife is public property. And uh, the government holds wildlife in trust for the benefit of the people, you know, of the state and of the nation. Uh, number two is wildlife cannot be slaughtered for commercial use. So this is really big. And we're going to have some, some pictures come up here, uh, which was uh, uh, really, uh, really neat to see some of these old pictures. And, and these guys with commercial use, you know, things were getting used. They weren't wasted, uh, but it was just overconsumption uh, of some of these uh, principles. Uh, Hunting seasons uh, were not really in effect. Uh, people hunted year round. Uh, people hunted all kinds of genders. Uh, there was really no regulation on any of that. So that's why that one became number two. Uh, wildlife is allocated by law. Every citizen in good standing, regardless of wealth uh, or social standing or land ownership is allowed to participate. And this comes from old, old times ago when uh, people in England and stuff, you know, you could not hunt on the king's land. Uh, so they wanted to keep everything uh, open to everybody who had actually a right to hunt. Uh, wildlife uh, is an international resource. Uh, it's not just in the US, it's not just in one state and not another state, uh, which is why this is called the North American model. So it encompasses Canada, uh, Mexico, uh, and of course the U.S. And uh, uh, wildlife is also, uh, uh, hunting and fishing should be managed cooperatively across all of these areas, not just one. Because naturally you can have all the laws you want in one state, but if you don't enforce them in the next one over, it, it doesn't really help you much. Uh, wildlife management, uh, and this is really big and we're gonna get into a couple in depth uh, descriptions on this one. Uh, it should be based on sound scientific knowledge. And we learned some things early on. Uh, and one is the lesson of the Kaibab. And uh, I've got a, a couple examples of the Kaibab and what we learned from that. And of course, number seven, hunting and fishing and trapping shall be democratic. It gives persons rich and poor alike the opportunity uh, to participate. So uh, with that being said, I'm going to move us back in, into 1864, which uh, some of us may know that's when Nevada first became a state. And our U.S. population was a grand 31,443,321. And uh, that's important to remember as we go through here. And so uh, here's some photos of some early on hunters. Uh, you can see some of these guys were, were more or less kind of sport hunters, uh, and you can basically tell by the way they're dressed. And this is a, a photo that was probably taken in the late teens, maybe even the early 20s, because you can see some of the firearms there are a little bit more modern compared to some of the photos that I'm going to be showing you here. Uh, so uh, keep in mind, it, during this time frame, uh, there wasn't the greatest refrigeration. So whenever you see large groups of animals and stuff like this that uh, has been uh, hunted uh, or collected, you can almost bet that it was more or less for a commercial use. It was going to a tannery. Uh, the feathers were getting uh, saved and used for clothing. Uh, the hides were all used. Uh, if you had uh, uh, antlers, uh, those antlers were all used for making knife handles or, or whatever uh, you could make uh, from that. So there wasn't really a lot of waste in all this stuff. It was just the excessive consumption and, uh, and the large use. Here's another one. Uh, you can obviously tell this leads a little bit more toward commercial hunting because these two guys in no way uh, could ever consume all of these type of ducks in any uh, reasonable amount of time. And, and keep in mind, there's absolutely nothing wrong with this photo uh, when this time frame. Uh, this, these guys were really successful people. Uh, they were doing really good. Uh, they were harvesting, they were taking care of it. Uh, they were selling it. Uh, it was just the overuse of it. And so the, some of this stuff was very common. 
we look at it now and we can kind of say, wow, uh, that's, you know, that's terrible. That doesn't make sense because we're used uh, in our generation uh, of uh, regulations and limits and you can only get so many, uh, you know, today in Nevada, you can harvest seven ducks a day. Well, you can tell these guys harvested way more than seven ducks a piece. Uh, so when we look at that, we think, wow, how could that be? But they didn't have any limits then. Uh, this was perfectly fine to go and do something like this, which is what sparked the memory of, hey, we probably need to do something. We need to start something. And the important thing to know with this is the people who started this were the people doing it. Uh, they realized we can't just keep harvesting an endless amount of wildlife and expect it to continue. Uh, so they're the ones that started a lot of these laws, a lot of these rules uh, that came to be. Uh, here's a deer camp and you can see there are several deer uh, harvested here. Uh, once again, uh, without proper refrigeration and stuff, this meat is only going to be uh, good for so long. It probably was, uh, you know, uh, commercialized and sent elsewhere and consumed by several other people. Uh, there were men and women alike that were doing this. Uh, everybody, you know, was involved with it, whether it was a buck or a doe. Uh, a lot of things didn't matter because we, we didn't have the science. We didn't have the knowledge uh, to know what can we do. And remember, there's only 31 million people uh, in the entire U.S. Keep that number in mind as we get a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, here's a scene uh, in a city where all these animals actually come into. Uh, these were going to a, a tannery a slash butcher. So the meat, the hide, the antlers, everything was getting used. And you can see there's, there's row after row after row of wagons uh, of this stuff. And once again, uh, it was all welcomed uh, because it was, you know, it was utilized. Uh, uh, here's uh, another one from uh, uh, the early 20s uh, here, uh, a single individual harvesting, uh, you know, this amount of duck. You would never see this kind of a photo today <laughs> uh, just because of regulations. And uh, here's one reason why, I mean, people utilized all this stuff in the cities uh, and in the country. So in the bigger cities, you know, ladies had the real fancy hats with all the feathers and everything. So there was a call for this material. Uh, and not only that, they wore fur coats. Furs were really big. Uh, we didn't have the synthetic material that we have today uh, that we make stuff out of. And here is a, a buffalo hide yard uh, in 1876 showing 40,000 buffalo hides. Well, if you wanted a leather coat in these days uh, for your ranch or when you were out riding around, this is where your leather coat come from. If you was in the city, uh, maybe you had a pair of fancy shoes made out of the, this leather. Uh, all this stuff was getting utilized. Uh, so it wasn't a waste per se. It was just the material that we as a society used uh, during this time. Here's a, uh, here's a tannery. If you look at that big bundle, uh, right here, uh, kind of in the middle, um, right here. Uh, those are actually all animal hides that had the hair shaved off each side. And uh, that is pure, you know, leather. Uh, and that was made for all kinds of things, uh, for gloves, hats, coats, shoes, pants, belts, uh, you name it. Uh, all that material got used for that. So that's why there was just a huge call for this stuff. Uh, uh, Here's another uh, a buffalo yard uh, out west. Um, and what really made a lot of this possible too was the railroad system. When the railroad system got out west and they could get this stuff back east, uh, they did transport more meat from buffalo back there. Uh, but primarily it was the goods uh, that was being used. Uh, trappers did the same thing. Uh, here is a, a, a beaver. A uh, bunch of trappers that have been trapping beaver. And you see how they got these all stretched out. They get a big load. They pile these on their horses and they head into town. They sell them. And then these goes for making hats, coats, uh, whatever have you. Uh, here's an early shot from the 1900s. Notice the top hat, but people wore real fur coats. <laughs> and uh, that's that was what they had. 
and if you were a person of uh, a little bit more wealth than others, the, this was kind of the coat that you got to wear. But they all, it wasn't all commercial use. Uh, here's some people that, you know, I mean, they hunted also for themselves. Uh, here's a lady that, that got a turkey. Uh, she went out and this is going to be food for her and the family. And here, the gentleman on the right uh, is right outside of town. Uh, he was harvesting fox and, uh, and coyotes that were coming in and, and getting into people's chickens. Uh, but he also utilized the hides from them as well. So there was lots of things going on at this time. Uh, this is actually a Nevada picture uh, that I found. I couldn't get the date on it, but I, I'm, uh, it looks like that rifle that she's got is probably an 1860s, maybe 1870s rifle. Uh, so I'm guessing this is the, you know, the late 1800s. And she's got a really nice mule deer buck up there in, in the sage, uh, sage desert land. And uh, once again, uh, hunting for herself and family it wasn't a commercial use. It was just uh, what people did uh, in those days, especially in areas outside the city uh, where that's what you needed if you wanted something to eat. Uh, here's a, a picture of one of the, the bigger cities. This is in New York. Uh, guys were wearing nice leather shoes and the ladies uh, nice dresses with all the fancy uh, hats and, the, and feathers and everything. You can see the lady back in the back there still has some feathers you know, tucked in her hair. And that's just what the population was doing. However, uh, this time-tested North American uh, wildlife conservation model is the only one of its kind in the world. And in the mid 1800s, hunters and anglers realized they needed to set limits uh, in order to protect rapidly disappearing wildlife. And you can see why uh, by some of those photos. Uh, they assumed the responsibility for managing wildlife habitats. Uh, hunters and anglers were among the first crusade for wildlife protection and remain some of today's most important conservation leaders. And if you get anything out of this presentation, I want you to get that out of it. Uh, because it was never anything that was intentional and, and people wanted to do, it just ended up moving that way. Uh, so remember that with the, that's in a nutshell, uh, the North American model uh, and its principal idea. Uh, I'm going to talk a minute about the Kaibab because this gets into one of the principles uh, of sound management. So the Kaibab, uh, if you're familiar with Arizona, is up around the Grand Canyon, the North Rim, and uh, uh, right around in here, in this area right in here. And uh, the Kaibab, it really is a uh, locked in geographical area. Uh, it's a block plateau, 45 miles wide by 60 north to south. Uh, canyons to the east, deserts and cliffs. And to the north is open, but sagebrush brush flats into Utah. So these deer are basically kind of landlocked in here. They'll come off this higher uh, ridge off this number uh, 67 road, which is kind of the the highest spot. Yeah, but when they get down in here, they run into the Grand Canyon and all the big cliffs, uh, but it's lower area. So they kind of winter there in that area, but they go back and forth. They don't migrate very far. Uh, so that's, uh, that's where the area is. And here's what happened. Um, before 1905, the deer on the Kaibab were estimated to be around only around 4,000. Uh, but the average carrying capacity of the range probably was around 30,000 at that time. So in 1906, when all this stuff kind of started happening, uh, uh, the President Roosevelt created the Grand Canyon National Game Preserve to protect the finest deer herd in America. Uh, you know, the idea was wonderful. It went right along with some of the principles that had come to be. Uh, unfortunately, by this time, uh, there had been a lot of overgrazing already on the Kaibab by cattle and sheep. And uh, most of the taller grasses had actually just been totally eliminated. Once again, it was a fairly small area if you put a lot of animals in there. So the first step uh, they thought would be, and once again, this is going uh, into some of our management aspects, was to ban all honey. Because that kind of made sense uh, if you think about it and you didn't know any better. Um, uh, let's not hunt any of the deer and there'll be more deer. Uh, in addition to that, 
they exterminated all the predators of the deer. So now there was nothing preying on the deer or very few things preying on the deer and uh, nobody hunting in there. Kind of makes sense to grow a deer herd, uh, but unfortunately uh, it was not the thing to do and we learned this. Uh, so signs that the deer population was out of control began to appear as early as 1920. Uh, the range was deteriorated uh, they, re they reduced completely the number of livestock and grazing permits. And uh, by 1923, all of those deer in that area were reported to be on the verge of starvation. Uh, it actually took the exact opposite effect uh, of what the original idea was. So the carrying capacity of the land was just totally exceeded. And when you exceed that, uh, things die off. That's pretty much... Uh, the story of that Kaibab. And you can see by the right over here, the years, I mean, we got up to 100,000 deer in 24, and then we plummeted back down uh, to 10,000. Uh, and you can imagine the amount of carnage and everything that you could find up in this area uh, around that time. So uh, it was estimated that just around 60,000 deer actually starved to death. So even though we were trying to uh, create that sound science and everything, we, we just did uh, the opposite. But we learned from that. And uh, Aldo Leopold, uh, who really is considered to be the father of wildlife ecology and management, uh, he was a lifelong fisherman and hunter. He view, viewed wildlife management as a technique for restoring and maintaining diversity because that's an important fact, the diversity of all species. And down at the bottom is a quote from him. Uh, and it says, he personally believed, at least in 1914, that when predator control began, there could not be too much horned game. And by that, he meant like deer and elk, anything with an antler uh, or a horn. Uh, and that getting rid of the predators was a reasonable price to pay for better big game hunting. Uh, but as it came to be, as I mentioned earlier, it just wasn't so. And, and we learned from that. And so he also had several principles, and one was this uh, uh, Leopold's land ethic. And conservation is a state of harmony between men and land. By land is meant by all things on it, over it, or in the earth. And harmony with the land uh, is like harmony with a friend. You cannot cherish his right hand and chop off his left. That is to say, you cannot love game and hate predators. You cannot conserve water and waste the ranges. You cannot build the forest and mine the farm. The land is one organism. And this really set us on a, a different approach to the sound science of wildlife management. And uh, here's an example. If we look to the far left, our breeding stock in the wintertime, spring comes and uh, everybody's producing young and the population completely grows. It gets up to its almost its max carrying capacity. And some animals are, are not gonna be able to get the nutrition they need. Uh, they're gonna starve. There's also gonna be disease, parasites, accidents, and weather. A lot of these things we have no control over. Now, then you've got hunting predators uh, that brings back your population down to the carrion capacity. And here's another one that's that uh, this is one of my favorite ones. It's like a big bucket. And once your carrying capacity gets full, things are going to spill over because the bucket can't hold anymore. So the accidents and pollution, disease, starvation, uh, predators and old age, there's not too much we can do about that. A little bit with disease we can attack. But you notice that over here on the side, there's a spigot and the spigot says hunting. We can turn up the hunting or we can turn down the hunting to regulate this bucket so it doesn't overflow. And that's gotta be one of the most important things to realize when it comes to big game hunting and small game hunting, uh, that we can really control that the population we have now and maintain animal populations at uh, you know the healthiest levels that they can be at. So this is one of my favorite slides and I, I hope everybody gets 
uh, how that kind of works. And I get this question all the time uh, with big game hunters, even here in Nevada. They said, well, there was, there was 150 deer tags in that area last year. Why is there only 40? Because we kind of closed off the, uh, the faucet some. Uh, and it works the other way. There was 40 deer tags in there last year. Why is there 150 now? Well, because through all of our surveying and everything that a biologist do, we open that spigot back up to keep that population uh, at its strongest point. So with all this stuff going on, uh, something had to be done. And it's that, it's that ugly word uh, that everybody hates to hear. Yes, funding. Uh, how are we going to enforce all this? How is all this stuff going to happen? How are we going to make people understand this? So here's a, uh, some photos of some early Nevada hunting license. Uh, this was going on, on all over the country. Some states had hunting license way before we did and vice versa. Uh, but these were some that were, were issued in, uh, I think the earliest one there was 1913, uh, 1914, 1924, 1925. In the old days, they were metal tags that you wore. And then it kind of went into paper. So that funding source originally started uh, going to the states, but not all states got that money to help hunting at that time. And that's what a lot of people don't understand uh, around this time frame because the early hunting license didn't go into uh, protecting wildlife and all that. It was just a means of gathering uh, funding. So uh, there was also a migratory bird stamps. The migratory bird stamp, this one right here, uh, I hope you can see my cursor. Uh, uh, it's right here, it's 1934. That's when the US Fish and Wildlife Service first came up with uh, the, uh, or Department of Agriculture, excuse me, uh, first came up with their first uh, migratory bird hunting stamp. And, and remember that it wasn't until 1934. So by now the Kaibas behind us, we're starting to learn all this stuff. We're starting to say, hey, we need funding. We, we need to get this stuff uh, organized and how are we going to do this? So here's a timeline and don't panic on this. So there's several pages of this and I'm just going to touch on a few of them. Uh, but the point of all of these events and timelines is showing you what the North American model is. Uh, it's no one thing. It is a conglomeration of all of these events that happen throughout decades and decades. And yes, funding uh, is in here. And we're gonna talk highly on that one. So uh, in 1871, uh, uh, the Fish and Fisheries Commission was created. Yellowstone National Park was established. Everybody was seeing, hey, you know, we're gonna have to watch wildlife. We're gonna have to do something. Uh, 1900, the Lacey Act was packed, or passed. Uh, which banned trafficking of illegal wildlife from state to state. Very important uh, because, you know, like everything, uh, when some of this came to be, not everybody believed in it. Not everybody wanted to abide by the law on it. Uh, so the Lacey Act was passed in 1900. Uh, uh, in 1903, uh, uh, Roosevelt established the first wildlife refuge on March 14th. And, and this is very important too because some of these uh, refuges and uh, management areas, uh, you know, they're a resting place, they're a protected place for a lot of waterfowl and migratory birds. Uh, remember, before this, there was nothing. There was no protection. You couldn't hide anywhere. Uh, and this added to migratory birds being able to reproduce, uh, having a safe haven, uh, and, uh, you know, and reproducing on a year basis. 1906, the Game Bird Preserves uh, had a Protection Act. 1913, the Federal Migratory Bird Law gives federal government authority over hunting of migratory birds. Uh, and the first migratory hunting regulations were adopted. Remember, that wasn't until 1913. So all this stuff was compiling. Uh, the tr uh, in 1916, a treaty was signed between the U.S. and Great Britain. Britain, which really was, was represented, uh, representing Canada and uh, to protect migratory birds because it did no good for us to protect them if Canada wasn't. And it did no good for Canada to protect them if we weren't. So this is where the North American thing uh, comes in to be. Um, 1918, uh, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. 
1933, Aldo Leopold writes game management. So we started getting the science involved with this. Uh, and we started uh, seeing different things and different approaches on how to protect and regulate wildlife in North America. Uh, 1933, the CCC camps uh, were created. And this was really important. Uh, employees uh, built infrastructures to improve habitat on 50 national wildlife refuges, uh, refuse and uh, hatcheries throughout the 30s. Uh, and these people uh, got $30 a month and $25 of this was sent to their family. So this was also something, because remember, look at this time frame here. We're during right during the Great Depression. Uh, so uh, these guys were able to work and, and build uh, the first roads and places and everything, and $25 went home to their family. Because they lived in tents, they were fed, they were housed, they didn't really need any more than five bucks. And there was probably nowhere to spend that five bucks anyway uh, as they did that. Uh, in the early days, my father was in the CC camps. Uh, that's, I, I know so much about that because he used to tell me uh, quite a bit. 1934, uh, the Migratory Bird and Hunting Conservation Stamp Act. Uh, as uh, I just showed you a, a little bit ago, that very first stamp from 1934. The Lacey Act was amended in 1935 to prohibit foreign commerce and illegally taken wildlife. So that means wildlife coming in, no matter if it was taken illegally somewhere else, you could not do it. 1936, the convention between the US and Mexico for the protection of migratory game birds is signed. So all this stuff happened early on. Uh, now one is highlighted here in green and there's a reason for that. Because in 1937, Congress passed the Federal Aid and Wildlife Restoration Act, uh, otherwise known as the Pittman-Robinson Act. Uh, this is very important still today. This is where the funding comes from. I'm going to get a little more in depth on this as we get through the presentation. I'm going to show you where the funding comes from, uh, everything that's taxed, uh, and who gets taxed. Uh, to generate the money that goes into the Wildlife Restoration or Pittman-Robinson Act uh, and how it gets utilized by each state. 1940, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service is created. Uh, so it was quite a, quite a time. Uh, 1949, uh, although Leopold uh, wrote the Sand County Almanac, which was kind of a book on the story of his life and how game changed from when he was a kid to now. Duck stamp, uh, Duck stamp Act increased fee to $2. Uh, 1956, uh, established a, a national fish and wildlife policy and broadened the authority uh, to develop uh, refuges. Uh, 1960, the Arctic National Wildlife Range uh, was established. So there was a lot of uh, national things getting uh, created. Uh, that was also added to protect. And not all uh, national parks and everything are close to hunting. Uh, some have sections that you can hunt on. Some are completely closed uh, all the way. Uh, so, but it was a, a, a way to uh, leave some protected spaces for wildlife. In 1964, the Wilderness Acts uh, created a system to include national wildlife refuges. Uh, 1967, the bald eagle uh, declared an endangered species. And in 1970, Endangered Species Conservation Act of 69 became effect prohibiting the importation into the US of species threatened with extinction worldwide. This is huge. And remember the Endangered Species Act because we're gonna bring that up a little bit later in the presentation too. Remember though, in 67, that's when the bald eagle was declared an endangered species. 72, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency bans the use of DDT. Uh, so there was all kinds of things going on uh, with this uh, Endangered Species Act and puts Fish and Wildlife Service and Marine Fisheries Science in charge of enforcing it. Uh, in 1977, the first plant species are listed as endangered. In 1986, the uh, American Waterfowl Management Plan was signed. So there's all these things going on. And that really is what the North American 
model of wildlife conservation is. Uh, some are, uh, you know, were, were really needed at the time uh, and they're still going strong today. And, and it was an, uh, an important thing uh, for that time frame. And remember the time frame was uh, we had the Great Depression, uh, we had world wars going on before the Great Depression and after the Great Depression. So the entire country was in turmoil with all of this taking place simultaneously. Uh, so it's quite, uh, quite interesting. Uh, new this year in, in 2021, uh, Recovering America's Wildlife Act, because a lot of these things uh, went after species that were really, really uh, needed or wanted, either for food, for feathers, uh, for something like that. Recovering America's Wildlife Act uh, looks kind of at other things uh, that uh, aren't exactly game species. Uh, you know, some uh, uh, reptiles, uh, things that people don't go out and commercially gather uh, or eat uh, or use for game and clothing. So the Recovering uh, uh, America's Wildlife Act is something new. And this is also added in to the North American model. And uh, uh, this is still in Congress right now, but it's expected to pass. And uh, it basically is a, a founding uh, through the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, uh, such as Endow and other state agencies, uh, and the Blue Ribbon Panel. Uh, on sustaining America's diverse fish and wildlife resources. So we're still at it. Even though we started back in the 1800s, uh, we're still at it as time rolls on today. Uh, we're gonna jump forward now to 2021. And, and now today the population is 332 million. And I hope you remember what the population was when we started in 1864. Uh, yep, it was 31 million. So we got quite a few more people here now. Uh, we really do. Uh, we uh, have to continue uh, with the amount of food that people need. This is a cattle farm, uh, uh, one cattle farm uh, down in Texas. And you see how huge it is. This is an aerial shot. Uh, but uh, these cattle are, are raised for just like some of the wild stuff was back in the old days uh, for leather, for hides, for meat, uh, everything's used. This is the modern day way uh, that if you go to a butcher, this is what you see when you go into the Smiths. Actually not this size, you're gonna see much smaller portions of this. Uh, we have chicken uh, farms and ranches. Uh, chickens uh, are also, you go into the store now, you buy your chicken and everything. Uh, it's really not much different than what our forefathers did with the, the wild game. So uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit here about the Federal Aid and Wildlife Restoration Act in depth a little bit. So uh, the whole point of this, it's, it's commonly known as the Pittman-Robinson Act and you can see the logo down there at the bottom. It says wildlife restoration, it's, they're one and the same. Uh, it has been amended several times uh, and that provides federal aid to states for management and restoration of wildlife. This is where the money comes from one way. Uh, funds from an 11% excise tax on sporting arms and ammunition, and uh, they're a portion to the Secretary of Interior, then a portion to the states on a formula base uh, for paying up to 75% of the cost of projects. So if we've got a $100,000 project, we need to come up with $25,000 of it. So uh, it's it's kind of a 75% uh, a fee. That's just an easy number to use. Uh, here's some of the things that gets taxed. And now this is not the sales tax that when you go to the store and you buy it and they say, okay, there's tax on it. This tax comes from the manufacturer before it ever gets to the store. Uh, it goes directly to whatever agency that it should. Uh, and then the US Fish and Wildlife Service collects that and allocates it appropriately. So if you're buying handguns, there's a 10% tax on that. Other firearms are 11%. Ammunition is 11%. Archery equipment is 11%. All these things, every time you buy something. Now, if you're not buying guns and you're not buying ammo, you're not contributing into this uh, because the manufacturer, when they get orders for their material, they send that portion to the US Fish and Wildlife Service. 
or whatever agency it's appropriated for. So here's how this cycle of success works. So your hunters and shooters, anglers and boaters purchase equipment and fuels right here in the center. And then the manufacturers pays excise tax to and custom duties on sales. So the tax is collected through the Alcohol Tobacco Trade Bureau, uh, the IRS, uh, the Internal Revenue Service, and the Customs and Border Patrol. It really depends on you know, what it is that is being taxed, uh, which agency it goes to. Then that is deposited uh, into the wildlife restoration uh, account uh, and sport fishing account uh, at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service then grant funds that are allocated to state resource agency. State fish and wildlife agencies fund projects like habitat, species restorations, research, management, uh, all these things. And then the industry benefit as well because sales go up, growth and conservation. And users benefit opportunities, choice and recreation. The fascinating thing about this entire thing is users are contributing to this funding, but everybody benefits. Uh, doesn't matter if you're a hunter or a fisherman. If you're out hiking and you see some elk and some deer, uh, that's all part of this big process. So it really is a user-based tax, uh, but everybody gets to benefit from it. Then, uh, for example, last year, there was $601 million created, and this is around the US, everybody. Uh, and the total revenue generated since 1939 is over $10 billion. Uh, and how does that work then? So a sum not to exceed 8% of the total fund may be deducted for administrative purposes uh, by the program. And then in a nutshell, this is the equation down here. You take your state population versus the national population, the state hunting license versus the national hunting license sold, state land mass versus the national land mass, and you, you run those figures together and then each state gets allocated a certain percentage of that. In a quick example, Alaska is a huge state. Uh, so when you look at the land mass in Alaska, you almost would wanna think, well, Alaska is gonna get the most money. No, because the state population in Alaska is not nearly as large as Texas. Uh, even though Texas is a smaller state, uh, Nevada is, is one of the same things. We have a very small population, but we have a very large state. Um, so that's pretty much how it is. Because there's more people, uh, the more people in the state, the more people are going to benefit from that. Uh, where did all this come from? Uh, the Pittman-Robinson Act? Uh, there was there was two men that took this to Congress uh, back in the 30s, and uh, one was uh, Absalom uh, Robinson, and he was a congressman in Virginia. And lo and behold, Key Pittman, who was a senator in Nevada, took this to Congress, got it passed, got the excise tax going right during you know the Depression and right before the World War II. Wow, uh, what an event that would be, huh? We're still hunting today. We're still hunting today because we regulate hunting. We can open and shut that valve. Uh, we have a lot better control over that. Um, right now, Nevada's experiencing you know, a good drought. Uh, we're hauling water. Uh, we're, we have the ability to adjust it to a certain point. Uh, here's an example of some things. If you look in the early 1900s over here, uh, there was estimated to be like 500,000 whitetail. Today, there's 32, 32 million, excuse me. Well, the first thing in a person's mind is how can that be when there was only 31 million people in 1864 and now there's 332 million? How can we have more deer? Well, that's because regulated hunting controls that. Sound management. I can't say that one enough. Uh, the management from bi biological studies in the field, uh, surveying, uh, and being able to turn that valve up and down uh, when it comes to hunting. And that's where the funding is coming from. That's why the North American model is one of its one of the kind. And it's uh, been very, very uh, beneficial uh, to everyone in, in North America. And other countries are seeing this as well. 
Remember, we talked about the Endangered Species Act and how the bald eagle was put on there. Well, on June 28, 2007, the uh, eagle was taken off the endangered species list. Uh, very great uh, success story uh, on that one. And keep in mind that the North America's approach to wildlife management is unique uh, to the world, uh, really. Uh, primarily in the United States and Canada, uh, where we manage as public trust resources for the benefit of all citizens. Uh, the model holds that sound science guide, wildlife management decisions, and regulations, uh, which are funded through the user pay public benefits. Uh, it's the American system of conservation funding because you have to have funding in order to be able to uh, do something as such. I'm going to talk here real quick about a little bit about uh, Nevada Department of Wildlife. You know, we started in 1877. Uh, in uh, 1917, we had a three member uh, wildlife commission. Uh, in 27, we had a three member state fish commission. <coughs> Excuse me. In 1947, uh, we moved to a five member. In 69, we had a 17 member. Uh, as you can see, we were right in the heart of all of these things being, uh, being created and being regulated. Uh, so that's pretty much us. We've been around a long time. Um, uh, we've been from one division to a department and a department to a division. And uh, in 2003, uh, we have been a, a department ever since then. Uh, what do we do with some of our funding from the Wildlife Restoration Act and, and Pittman-Robinson, one and the same? So our funding provides restoration, rehabilitation, and improvement of wildlife habitat uh, and wildlife management research and, and hunter education. Uh, last year in 2020, we received uh, $10 million from the Pittman-Robinson Act to be able to do all of this stuff. So it's not a tax money that comes out of the general fund of the state. It's coming from the federal government, from all the excise tax, from all of the users of the firearms and ammunition. Uh, how do we get our main funding source? License sales, boat registration, uh, federal grants, the Pittman Robinson, conservation license plate, uh, and conservation groups. There's a lot of really neat uh, energized groups uh, in the entire state of Nevada. Bighorns Unlimited, uh, the Paternity of the Bighorn Sheep, all these kind of uh, conservation groups aid in the uh, wildlife restoration for Nevada. What do we do with some of it? Well, we uh, introduce species or reintroduce them uh, into areas where uh, they naturally were found. Here's some bighorn sheep uh, that we had moved into an area that uh, naturally was found there, but no longer exists there. Uh, uh, management, as we said, this is where this funding goes to. Research, uh, these things are, their blood gets drawn on them. They're seeing how healthy the herd is. Uh, they're ear tagged, radio collared. Uh, improvement in some areas, we have uh, uh, a, over a thousand water catchments uh, and big and small game around the state. Uh, because as you know, Nevada is a pretty dry state, especially in the, in the lower part uh, of Nevada. But these guzzlers are found all over the state, north, south, east, and west. Uh, and here's a crew of volunteers out building this water catchment. You see the tanks up on the side. When it rains, those things fill up with water and then animals can benefit from it on the right. Whenever we don't get rain, which right now we, we have not been getting a lot of rain uh, in Nevada at all. And uh, so we are hauling water and we will fill up those water catchments so animals have water in there to make it through these extreme droughts because we don't want this population to fall down like it did on the Kaibab, uh, crash down. Uh, that's not our intent. We've got to keep going with it. Here's a big game guzzler, but anything can use this, you know, small games, uh, a small game, uh, foxes, coyotes, birds, uh, anything can get into this. Uh, we use a lot of volunteers. If you have any interests in, in helping, uh, you can always contact one of our departments uh, or one of our offices and uh, volunteer to be a volunteer. Uh, you can see these guys are moving uh, large tanks around right here. Uh, this is a small game guzzler. This is a little different. Uh, we don't really drop water on these. These catch rain when it does rain. 
Uh, you can see this is a very old sign uh, put up there probably during the 50s. Uh, we were called Nevada Fish and Game Department back then. And you see it says this is a Pittman Robinson project for wildlife restoration. So this has been around a long time. It's been very successful. When it does rain, it's like an eaves trough here. It catches all that water uh, and it funnels it underneath. So the sun's off of it. Smaller game like rabbits and quail and foxes and things like that can get underneath there and uh, get water. The funding also helps contribute to wildlife crossings. We have quite a few in Northern Nevada. Uh, we have a couple here in Southern Nevada for bighorn sheep. Uh, you'll see some that goes over roads and some that goes under. Here's one that goes under. So there's all these activities that happen. It's a multiple species, uh, species use. Uh, here's an example of a bighorn sheep and you've got some chucker uh, on there. You'll see all kinds of game using these. Uh, whether it be eagles uh, on the bottom down there, mule deer, you got mountain lions, you got bighorn sheep. Uh, here's a couple of deer uh, in the Spring Mountains uh, coming up uh, to a guzzler, and you can see this. There's different types of them. This one actually has the uh, the drinker right on the end of it, uh, so they get right in there, get their water, and go on their way. Another thing that this funding does, it creates shooting ranges. It creates uh, shooting ranges to the point where, because if a person is buying guns and buying ammo, they need to have a place to go shooting. Uh, we're trying to keep them out of the desert uh, onto ranges uh, or areas where uh, people uh, won't get into any trouble uh, with that. And so ranges you'll see like this has signs on it that says this range was constructed in part with funds from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Wildlife Restoration Fund. It also helps us create management areas, uh, which can be safe havens for wildlife uh, and can be controlled uh, much easier for, and you can hunt on these. Uh, these are hunting areas, but they're also uh, maintained in a way that uh, wildlife uh, can flourish on them. Hunter education is a very important thing. This program is funded by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, and the Pittman-Robinson Act. So uh, in closing here, uh, the North American model for wildlife conservation is a conglomeration of stuff. It's no one thing. Uh, several important facts uh, have come to lead us to where we are today. Uh, we have more wildlife today uh, than we did in those earlier years, even though there was quite a bit less people. Uh, remember the seven principles, uh, those principles still stand today. The lesson of the Kaibab, wildlife laws and acts, we've, we've got them and they are to protect wildlife and regulate how we uh, harvest and, and manage the wildlife. Obviously the wildlife restoration is a huge funding ability. Uh, Pittman-Robinson funding equation is very important to states. So buy a hunting and fishing license. Uh, that's one of the best ways that you can contribute to the Nevada Department of Wildlife. Uh, we talked about our timeline a little bit. We've been around for a long time and we uh, got to show you some of the projects that uh, we work on uh, pretty regularly. And uh, with that being said, uh, I would like to oops, probably turn this back over to Dawn, if Dawn is there. and. Uh, We've got our closing slide, and uh, if there's any questions, uh, we can type those into the question and answer, and uh, maybe Dawn can bring them up. Dawn? Marty, that was awesome. That was loaded with a lot of great information. Um, so on closing, I'm not seeing any questions at this point. Um, wildlife management is a system based off of ethical and scientific principles and effort to maximize conservation of species. And our motto right now is just take a break, embrace the outdoors, and practice responsible recreation. And we'd like to thank you for joining us tonight. If you have any questions, we'll hang out for a few seconds and um, wait to see if there's any questions that come in. But thank you for joining us tonight. And Marty, that was wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank you, Don, and uh, it was fun doing it. Corey says thank you. Thank you, Corey.
And on closing note, you will receive a survey link. We encourage you to fill those out. Give us your feedback. It lets us know how we did and maybe what you'd like to see more of. And on that note, have a wonderful night, everybody. Marty, thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night.